Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with our lesson series, Prototokus Mystery. This will be part 297. We're continuing with our lesson titled, The Seed of the Serpent. This will be part 3. Now, <clears throat> in uh, context with our lesson titled, The Seed of the Serpent, we have been gathering information from the scripture about a class of serpent seed called the tares. The tares are ancient Luciferian spirits that incarnate into the human race. They are not of the race of Adam. They are of an ancient race that partook of the fall of the Luciferian order. They are loyal to Lucifer, they are programmed by him, and they <clears throat> basically are infiltrators into the human race to cause the human race to dysfunction, to be destroyed as much as possible, and to become ineffective. Yes. And they have the attributes to try to duplicate, to simulate true Christian behavior and knowledge and understanding and mannerisms. They, they try to be convincing in their mannerisms and they're deceptive from their, from their root. Mm -hmm. Yes. What we find... <clears throat> so, how do you, so how do you distinguish them other than the... the By the characteristics. Jesus said, by their fruit you shall know them. And what they do. We want to take a look at the characteristics <coughs> so they can be detected. Uh, tares look like wheat in similarity. But instead of being nutritious, they're poisonous. And it's the same respect with the tare spirit. The tare spirit can easily be mistaken for a normal person, but when it's given the authority to influence life, it always, without fail, takes whatever it has influence over down to destruction. Now, Scripture teaches the principal characteristic of the tear is the disregard for the things or the people of God. Total disregard for anything that pertains to God or anyone that is connected to God. They are automatically programmed to render ineffectual the things and the people of God. Yes. My immediate, very first thing that came to me as you're speaking is the absence of love. Yes. But you find that in the human race in general. <clears throat> Man, because of the fall, doesn't exercise love anyway. You have to be in Christ to do that. Best you can do <coughs> is a human uh, phileo, you know, f family affection, that sort of thing. But man isn't capable of true love anyway. What we want to take a look here is some examples of this. Genesis 25, verse 34. Here we have the family <coughs> of Isaac, Isaac's two sons, Jacob and Esau. Esau is the eldest son, he has the birthright, he has all the promises that <coughs> Elohim had uh, given to Abraham, who Abraham passed down to Isaac, Isaac passed him down to Esau, and we're in a situation here where Esau 
who's a hunter, has no, had no luck in the field, he comes in hungry, and Jacob is making uh, soup. Verse 33. Jacob said, Swear to me this day, and he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob for a bowl of soup. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, <clears throat> and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. The word despised there in Hebrew means had contempt for. He didn't have a second thought about what he had done. He was just content to be satisfied with a meal. And uh, <clears throat> that was all that it was, in, it was important to him. God looked at this. And God, well, from, from eternity, God said, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, Esau have I despised. Which brings us to the next principle. Scripture teaches this contempt, this characteristic of <clears throat> disregard, contempt for the things of God and God's people, was passed down to Esau's descendants. Scripture teaches this contempt was passed on down to his descendants. We're going to take a look at some of the egregious effects that the tares have had on the human race, starting with Israel. And of course, their line branches off into non-Israelite circles. But everywhere they go, they bring misery, war, and agony to the human race. Turn to Numbers 20, verse 14 to 21. Numbers 20, verses... Is this like a generational curse? Yes. The line of the tares are <clears throat> inimical to the human race. It's like uh, they're poison. They're parasitical. They draw the life out of the human race. Numbers 20. Now in this passage of Scripture, you're going to see Israel is coming out of captivity to Egypt. They're crossing the Sinai on the way to the promised land, it's a long trek. They know that uh, they can make it shorter and lighter if they're allowed to pass through the land of Edom. And so they come to the border of Edom and they petition the Edomites to let them pass. We're going to pick it up. Numbers 20, we're going to start in verse 14. And then we're going to read down to verse 21. <clears throat> Moses sent messengers from Kadesh unto the king of Edom. Thus saith thy brother Israel, Thou knowest all the travail that have befallen us, how our fathers went down into Egypt, and we have dwelt in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians vexed us and our fathers. Now, the Edomites knew the sufferings, the slavery, the bondage that the Israelites were in, and they never, never lifted a finger to ease their burdens or to at least try to make thing, mitigate matters for the Israelites. 400 years they were content to... Uh, watched things that were happening and literally delighted in the sufferings of their people. So Moses here <clears throat> basically brings to their memory, number one, their relationship, their brothers, number two, the affliction that they knew, the Edomites knew, the Israelites were suffering for all this period of time. Let's continue on. Verse 16. <clears throat> And when we cried unto the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and hath brought us forth out of Egypt. And behold, we are in Kadesh, 
a city in the uttermost parts of thy border. <coughs> Let us pass, I pray thee, through thy country. We will not pass through the fields or through the vineyards, neither will we drink of the water of the wells. We will go by the king's highway. We will not turn to the right hand nor to the left until we have passed thy borders. And Edom said unto him, Thou shalt not pass by me, lest I come out against thee with the sword. And the children of Israel said unto him, We will go by the highway. <coughs> and if I and my cattle drink of thy water, then I will pay for it. I will, <coughs> I will only, without doing anything else, go through on my feet. And he said, Thou shalt not go through. And Edom came out against him with much people, and with a strong hand. <clears throat> Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his border, wherefore Israel turned away from him. They never lifted a finger to help them whatsoever. <clears throat> now this is mild. We're going to take a look at some egregious things that they brought on the Israelites. 1 Samuel. Turn to 1 Samuel. 22nd chapter. 1 Samuel, 22nd chapter. Now what we have, excuse me, turn first to 1 Samuel, the 21st chapter. That'll give you right across the page. That'll give you an understanding of the background for this. David is on the run from Saul. Saul is trying to overtake him and kill him, him and his men. David goes to a city called Nob, which is a city of priests of uh, the Lord. Only priests live there. They serve the Lord 24 hours a day. They have a temple there, worship service. David goes there seeking food and uh, anything that they can give him to help his men. First Samuel 21, starting in verse 1, we're going to read down to verse 7. <clears throat> then came David to Nob, to Ahimelech, the priest. Ahimelech was afraid at the meeting of David, and said unto him, Why art thou alone, and no man with thee? David said unto Ahimelech the priest, The king hath commanded me a business, and hath sent <coughs> and said unto me, Let no man know anything of the business whereabout I send thee, and what I have commanded thee, I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. Now therefore, what is under thine hand? Give me five loaves of bread in my hand, or what there is present. So David tells the king, uh, tells Ahimelech, the high priest, <coughs> well, I'm doing business for King Saul. Now the priest doesn't know that Saul has uh, been trying to uh, kill David. All the priest knows is from the time of David uh, slaying Goliath and the things that happened after that. So this... This man is totally ignorant of what's taking place. David is just telling him, well, I'm here to try to get some supplies because I'm doing business for the king. Verse 4. And the priest answered David and said, There is no common bread under mine hand, but there is hallowed bread. If the young men have kept themselves at least from women. And David answered the priest and said unto him, Of a truth, women have been kept from us about these three days since I came out and the vessels of the young men are holy and the bread <coughs> is in a manner common yea though it be sanctified this day in the, in the vessel so the priest gave him hallowed bread but there was no bread there but the show bread that was taken from before the Lord to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away so the priest gives David bread for his men. 
Now there was a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord, and his name was Doeg, an Edomite, and the chiefest of the herdsmen that belonged to Saul. So Doeg was there. He was a uh, an official in Saul's court. He had authority over certain uh, individuals that were servants of Saul. That sets the stage. David takes the bread and leaves. Saul, uh, Saul comes up to the city. Drop down to uh, 1 Samuel 22. Now, we're going to start in verse 9. And we're going to read down to verse 18. Actually, <clears throat> we're going to start in verse 7. Read down to verse 18 so you get a bit, bit of a picture of it. Then Saul said unto his servants that stood about him, Here now, you Benjamites, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards and make you captains of thousands and captains of hundreds, that all of you have conspired against me, and there is none that showeth me, <coughs> and none that showeth me that my son hath made a league with the son of Jesse, talking about his son Jonathan, and there is none of you that is sorry for me, or showeth unto me that my son hath stirred up my servant against me <clears throat> to lie in wait as at this day. So Saul is lamenting, going through a pity party <clears throat> about everybody's against him and nobody's standing for him. And uh, <clears throat> even his son is against him and blah, blah, blah. For nothing. Because there's nothing there. He's trying to make something because the man is under a demonic influence. Verse 9. Then answered Doeg the Edomite, which was set over the servants of Saul, and said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, to Habimelech, the son of Ahiathob. And he inquired of the Lord for him, and gave him victuals, and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. Then the king sent to call Ahimelech the priest, the son of Ahiatub, in all his father's house, the priests that were in Nob, and they came all of them to the king. Saul said, Hear now, thou son of Ahiatub. And he answered, Here I am, my lord. Saul said unto him, Why have ye conspired against me, thou and the son of Jesse, in that thou gavest him bread and a sword, and hast inquired of God for him, that he should rise against me, to lie in wait as at this day? <clears throat> then Ahimelech answered the king and said, And who is so faithful among all thy servants as David, which is the king's son-in-law, and goeth by thy bidding? and is honorable in thy house. So, uh, 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 um, <coughs> uh, lack doesn't know what's happened. The last thing he knows is Saul, is that David was taken into Saul's governing council and a high official in that because of what he did against Goliath, that he was basically Saul's right-hand man as far as this high priest was concerned. <clears throat> means nothing to Saul. Verse 15. Did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Being far from me, let not the king impute anything unto his servant, not to all the house of my father. For thy servant knew nothing of all this, less or more. <clears throat> king said, Thou shalt utterly, thou shalt surely die, Ahimelech, thou and all thy father's house. The king said unto the footmen that stood about him, Turn and slay the priests of the Lord, because their hand also was with David, and because they knew when he fled and did not show it to me. But the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priests of the Lord. They knew better. 
And the king said to Doeg, the Edomite, Turn thou and fall upon the priests. And Doeg, the Edomite, turned and fell upon the priests and slew on that day fourscore and five persons that did wear a linen ephod. Eighty-five priests of the Lord this man slew. Not only did he slay them, in Nob, the city of the priests smote he with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and sucklings and oxen and asses and sheep with the edge of the sword. Only one man escaped. <clears throat> Verse 20, one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub named Abathiah, escaped and fled after David. So he goes and tells David what happened. Mm. This guy killed, wiped out a priest city with everything in it, men, women, and children, and animals, yes. Yeah. So should we understand that the king knew at the point, verse 18, at the point that he turned to Doeg, that because of the strife between the Edomites and, uh, and Israel, he would you know, he would take on that, uh, that function. No, he wasn't even interested in that. <coughs> what he was interested in <coughs> was David. David, David was an enemy. And everybody in his twisted and distorted view was against him. Nobody was against him because his retinue was there. They were his company. He's imagining stuff. The high priest didn't even know there was strife between Saul and David. Okay. So therefore, Doeg did it purely because he's an Edomite. Because he's an right. Edomite. But he's David, a terror. But uh, Saul didn't understand that. that was okay. He wasn't interested. Right. What he was interested in was killing David. Mm. That was the one thing on his mind and wiping out anybody that he perceived was for David. Right. Doeg is a tear. Mm. Now, he didn't raise his hand against David. He rose his hand against YHVH because tears despise God, the things of God, and God's people. The man wiped out a priest city 85 priests of God. Nobody that I read about in the scripture of an enemy of a heathen would do that. Mm. I mean, they'd fight Israel, but they weren't this cold-blooded and heartless to, to just totally despise and hate God and the things of God. But the Edomite line, this is, a, this is what we're talking about, the characteristics of a tear. The characteristics of a tear, they have no regard for humans, God, or the things of God. And we see an example here with Doeg. The priest, the, uh, the people of Saul's retinue wouldn't dare lift a hand against a, 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 a priest who wearing the ephod of YHV. So they know it would bring a judgment on them, that the eternal judgment. None of them would do that. Doeg did. Do you believe that an Edomite who was not a tear, he was uh, an Adamic, would do that? I don't see any Adamic Edomites in this. Oh, that's interesting. Edom is a tear. <laughs> he is lined. The bloodlines are tears. You may get Adamics here and there, but the line are tares and not human. Mm. And we're looking at the influence that they have on the human state, the human condition, the world of humans. They are infiltrators programmed to steal, kill, and destroy anything on the human level that pertains to man or God. We're going to take a look at a, another example here. Matthew. Second chapter, verse 1 to 6. Now when Je Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea 
in the days of Herod the king. Herod is an Edomite, descendant of Esau. In these times, the New Covenant, the New Testament, they're not called Edomites, they're called Idumeans. And Edom had reached a point under Satan where it was ruling over Israel in the form of the line of the Herods, the kings. <clears throat> now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. They said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And now thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Now Herod looked at this as a threat to his throne. He looked at Jesus as a competitor and he was terrified that this would eventually be somebody that would overthrow his throne. So he decided in his own mind he was going to prevent this from happening. Drop down to verse 16. The wise men are sent to Bethlehem. They pay tribute to the Lord. They leave. Herod realizes that they're not coming back to tell him anything. And he goes off the deep end. <clears throat> then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time when he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah, was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they were not. This Edomite wiped out <coughs> children, babies, sucklings, without a concern whatsoever. They have no regard for the human race. It's hard for us to comprehend this type of uh, cruelty and coldness, callousness. We have to understand something. The human race has been in bondage since the fall. The rulers are tares. Yes, you occasionally get an Adamic in there, but mostly the Adamic is to sell out Adamic anyway for power. But the majority of the things that happen to the human race is at the hands of of tares that have authority, life and death authority. They keep man in ignorance. They keep man in poverty. <clears throat> they keep man in a state in which he cannot thrive. Turn again to Psalms 82. Starting in verse 2. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked. Those are tares. How do they get in power? Principalities favor them. Principalities engineer conditions where they can rise to power. Wealth, all the rest of it, that would be for the Adamics, but they steal from the Adamics 
and they foster their own uh, aggrandizing agendas. Those what it goes on to say. And accept the person of the wicked, seal them. Defend the poor, the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked, the tares. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. Tares, an alliance with the individual, the fallen intelligences in the heavens, are keeping the human race in bondage. <clears throat> this society is a box from which the parameters are <clears throat> limiting and suffocating the human race. The human race is like cattle penned in and being <clears throat> slaughtered ad nauseum, being limited by <clears throat> the forces that are right against them. That's why this thing has to fall. What we're coming on, the beginning of sorrows, is not the beginning of sorrows for the prototypist teacher nor for the Adamic race. It's the beginning of a breaking of the shackles that have been binding the human race since the fall. Now we want to focus a little bit on that. <coughs> Scripture teaches because of the mistreatment of Israel by Edom in the tribulation period this is going to be the final straw Edom <coughs> the tear nation shall suffer the judgment of God. This is judgment hanging over the tares. We read about that last week. It's going to be rounded up one day, separated from the humans, and judged the second coming. The gods. What is um, Idumea known as today? Jordan. Mm. Are there any other ten nations that you're aware of? Sure. All that region spawned tares. Okay. But the whole, the, whole, the whole line is what we're talking about. The, in the Arab world, it is the a generator is of tears. Yes, the whole thing is Israel. They hate Israel. Uh, Hamas? They're a bunch of tears. Was Ishmael a tear? No, I don't think so. But he was the father of the Arab nations. Sure. Mm. Uh, just like Adam was the father of Cain, but sure. Adam wasn't a tear. Sure. They infiltrate into the human race. Now we're going to look at the, the, the ultimate destiny of the Terra nations and the Terra line, particularly Edom. Scripture teaches because of the mistreatment of Israel. They're going to be, as badly as they were treated before in the tribulation period, they're going to be treated to the nth degree in a worse situation than they ever have been by the tares. <clears throat> Edom is going to suffer judgment of God. Turn to Joel, third chapter, 19 to 21. Hey, Joel. I'm going to read 19 to 21. <clears throat> Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom shall be a desolation, a desolate wilderness, for the violence against the children of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall dwell forever, and Jerusalem from generation to generation. For I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. So you see the ultimate and here, the tear nations like Egypt, Jordan, <coughs> the regions around that are going to suffer tremendously. We're going to take a look at the specifics. Isaiah 34, <coughs> verses 5 to 11. <coughs> Uh, 
for my sword shall be bathed in heaven, and behold, it shall come down upon Idumea, it's another name for Edom, and upon the people of my curse. The people of my curse are the tares, the seed of the serpent. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness, with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Basra. Basra is the capital of Adumea, uh, which would be present-day Jordan. And a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. And the unicorn shall come down with them, and the bullocks with the bulls, and their land shall be soaked with blood, the dust made fat with fatness. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, and the year of recompense for the controversy of Zion. In other words, it's payback for what they've done to Israel. Now, whereabouts in the tribulation we see in this? End of the tribulation. So just before the second, second coming? At the second coming. At the second coming. Yeah. Everything is going to <coughs> culminate in a global judgment against the Luciferians. So this is part of Armageddon then? Yes. Okay. Yes. <coughs> Notice what happens. In the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, the dust thereof into brimstone, the land thereof shall become burning pitch, <coughs> and it shall not be quenched night nor day, and the smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever and ever. So what he's talking about <coughs> is what is the region of the Idumeans, the Edomites, they're, they're going to be in this kingdom. The kingdom conditions are going to be turned into hellish, nightmarish conditions with the masses in them. So this is similar to the woe to the pastors in that their estates will immediately turn into... Exactly, okay. yes. <clears throat> it's going to be turned into brimstone and fire and the conditions of the death hell region is going to envelop them and then God's going to put a barrier around it as we read just before world. you go on which yeah. is greater in the intensity of the curse the pastors or the um, the, tear, the tear nations I'd say probably the tear nations hmm. because of um, what they have done okay. Okay, verse 11. Put the concormant, and the bittern shall possess it, the owl also, and the raven shall dwell in it, and shall stretch out upon it. Oh, okay, <clears throat> shall dwell in it, and he, God, shall stretch upon it the line of confusion. Now, the word confusion there comes from a, a Hebrew term. Tohu, which means waste, it means emptiness. And the stones of emptiness, the word emptiness there means, comes from bohu, means <coughs> desolation. Same words you use when Lucifer fell, tohu vaboru. It's going to be surrounded by a barrier, impenetrable barrier, of desolation, emptiness. In other words, it's taken out of <coughs> reality, the reality zone, and put in this zone of torment. Remember, God is a state of existence personified, and He creates states of existence. He separates them. <coughs> Where he has life is, they become paradises. Where he takes life out of, they become hells, wastelands. The tear regions and the tear people are going to become denizens of 
zones, regions of lifelessness to be drained consistently by these creatures. These creatures are described in, in various ways. They are life forms that inhabit the, uh, the zones of torment. Just like you have the worm that sucks life out of the individual that goes into that region, so you have these creatures that basically flourish in a death environment. They're created to do that, to be that, to add to the torment and the agony of individuals that are dwelling there. Yes. <clears throat> He's not going to create any more of those regions, right? What do you mean? Death that? zones, torment regions, hell. It's already established. No. No, we just read. This is going to happen at the second coming. The the punishment for tears has not yet been brought forth because they got it, they're still free to do their thing to bring about the Father's master plan. At the time when this takes place, remember what we read in the parable of the sower. Jesus says, let the two grow together. Mm -hmm. And at the time of the judgment, then they're going to be dealt with. Right. So, But the point is that the curse, which I think is what he's saying, the curse is already on them. It's just we're waiting for the time for it to be activated. Sure. Mm. Yeah. But it hasn't been yet. The, 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 you see what, what what's taking place now. If we take a realistic look at this thing, tears have taken over the earth. Whenever a tear takes over the earth, you get the same situation. Wars, famines, pestilence, egregious behavior. World War II, Hitler was a tear. He brought destruction on his own people, let alone the rest of the world. Mao Zedong was a tear. He killed 80 some odd million of his own people. Stalin was a tear. On and on and on. Since their time, it's just been tears going from one place to another and sell out adamics that are bringing egregious conditions on people. Why do you have a deep state? Super they weren't the voted in office, sure. they're tears. Sure. What are they doing? Causing wars, egregious conditions. Uh, Kissinger was a tear who bombed those uh, uh, poor Cambodian people back to the Stone Age. Johnson was a tear, wiping out Vietnam. He started the Vietnam War. Why? We weren't in any danger. We, we, we didn't have anything to do with what was going on over there. He engineered all of this for his own political purposes and his own design, his own desire. The country is run by tears. You're talking about Eisenhower. Sure. Warning people about the military industrial uh, 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 the military industrial organization, they're tears. Yeah. Why do you have UFO secrecy? Because tears are running the thing. Just Why do you have what's going on in the universities? Minds are being corrupted. Why do you have abortion? They're tears. Euthanasia, they're tears. They want to wipe out the human race. And they have a program to gain more and more and more and more power over the human race. And we're seeing everything today. We're seeing it. Yeah, because they're coming into vogue. The human race has got a sheep mentality. It can't see. Well, we just read in, in, in Psalms, Psalms 82, 82, they know not. They walk on in darkness. They don't want to totally ignorant. Mm -hmm. And they won't receive the truth because they've been so programmed to hold on to a lie that it's 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 heart wrenching for them to let the thing go, to uh, embrace life as it was meant to be lived. So coming back to the Tear region, I'm going to focus on Persia. Mm -hmm. In recent years, in fact, for the past 20 years that I'm aware of, and I'm sure it's you know more than that, we hear more about the dreams of people seeing Jesus in Persia than we do in any other region around the world. I'm not saying it doesn't happen in other regions around the world. Well, just you, you, also have we, it in, you also have it in the, in the Middle East, the Saudi Arabia. And right. Okay. Agreed. But it's, it's for, for, for some reason, Persia seems to be the one we really hear about. And the yeah. question was, mm -hmm. is that because it's a tear region and the Lord is doing everything he can to turn them into 
not sense. No, just the opposite. It's an mm. endemic region under the influence of tares. Okay. The mullahs that run Persia are tares. So hang on one second. Jo Jordan, <clears throat> the whole nation as a bloodline, you know, within reason, is tare. Mm -hmm. But Persia is not. No. Mm. Persia treated the Jews better than any than the Babylonians, okay. anybody else. Okay. They wouldn't leave Persia to go back to Israel. So then we're understanding that the reason for the propensity of dreams in and around the Persian region is because of what you've just said. Sure. Okay. That's where your elders are. Yeah. Wise men came out of Persia. You seen the star in the sky? No, no, they're they're um, potentially Adamics under the dominion of Tares. Okay. And uh, they treated egregiously. Well, the United States is heading in that way also. Mm. A society under the dominion of... T what type of endemic society would deny its people the ability to grow food? In the UK, you're not allowed to buy seeds. Here, you can buy seeds. For the time being. Right. But in the UK, the kings, basically, like in Israel, are tares. That's why... <laughs> That's why you had the rebellion in the first place. Mm -hmm. People got tired of that stuff and they wanted something better. Nazi Germany, Adolf Hitler was a tear. Sure. <clears throat> what is it? What is the the the, the uh, characters of a tear? He's going to start a war, or he's going to set people in egregious bondage under his authority. Mm -hmm. In uh, organized religion, run by tears. They will not give people the truth. Scribes and the Pharisees were tares. Jesus called them out on it. He says, you're of your father the devil. Mm -hmm. What did they do to the Israelite people? Mistreated them to death. They would steal their property. They would um, misuse their authority to keep the people in bondage, egregious bondage. So it's a sign for terror. Across the board. And this country is unique in that it's been given a grace period from terror influence. Praise the Lord. Which it has not, because of its foolishness, sought to comprehend and understand and uh, 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 allow it to maintain our Constitution. If we live by the Constitution, you'd be, the country would be tear free. Sure. Because they couldn't get power to amalgamate a totalitarian uh, 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 um, regime, the people would have access to the <clears throat> wealth of the nation, not uh, class systems, if the Constitution were abided by. Mm. So then we understand that the people will never understand the thrust of what you've just said, being they've had this blessing where they could have had the time to learn the things that we're learning here. By the time of the beginning of Sorrows, it's too late. Sure. They won't even have time to look back and think, well, hang on a second, Did what, you know, let's compare this sure. and that. that they're not, be, they're not that open to it now. They have been, the, the, the influence is so egregious on the carnal mind now of human beings that everything is diversion. You can't get a person to take the time to consider sure. The things that hold him in bondage, because he's got these aversions mm -hmm. that are demanding his attention to keep him from. I mean, you go to the park, you have a Bible study. You got barking dogs, planes <laughs> flying all over the place. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's not an accident. Yes. <clears throat> what is enmity? Enmity is strife, antagonism, conflict. Mm. The carnal mind is enmity. It's God. Yeah. Yeah. Hatred. It's, just, yes. it's a, uh, you know, you just shocked me back into understanding again the, you know, beginning of the sorrows. It's too late to yes. change your mind. Yeah. You do it now. Right. And maybe you you get you know right. gathered. But right. the thing of it is, is see what you're saying. It's too late to change your mind. You won't even have the ability to look. Um, with some sense of judgment, some sense of discernment, to even begin to change, because to change your mind, you've got to consider something, haven't you? At that point, there's no consideration about anything. You're under, that's it, it's all over. Well, the Lord said it would come as a snare, it's going to be like a net. Yeah. When it falls, they're going to be too busy struggling.
to say, have any time to be objective about anything. That's the key word, objectivity. It doesn't exist. At that point, of the beginning of the story, it no longer exists. It don't exists here. How many people can you have an objective conversation with? Not many. Everybody's Very opinionated. Many. People are scared to death to even express an objective opinion because they'll be labeled as a, uh, a hate speech or a bigot or against this or against... Satan and the Luciferians are shrewd. They know exactly how to engineer situations of bondage upon the human psyche. I can honestly say, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, that every single person, every single person that I've met in the church has refused to accept what the Word is clearly telling us. Certainly. Not, yeah, and when you when you lead them towards it, the rejection is... You get uh, opposition, powerful. yes. Yeah. It's a programming. It's not an accident. Yeah, well, the whole thing is they've been digesting on a staple of half-truths mm. and, and distortions. So they have they have no ability to ascertain. They're, they're, they have no tools in the box mm -hmm. which will give them accurate data to, to follow to become greater than they... Than Satan has a design custom made for everybody to keep everybody in a particular state of bondage. Jesus had an antidote for that. He said, know the truth, the truth will make you free. The only way you can escape that is to be a truth seeker, pursuing truth. Not willing to settle for what appears to be truth, but knowing in a willingness to test all things to make sure that they're true. Because there are things, there's traps and snares. I was talking to this, uh, hearing this guy talk about his search. He was a searcher. And he tried different religions. He tried Judea. He grabbed a rabbi one day and he said, I want to sit down and talk to you about what you believe in and why you believe it. And rabbi gave him... <coughs> Uh, his reasons and everything. He talked to a Christian. Christian gave him his reasons and everything. He wound up being a Muslim. A committed Muslim. Why? Because they gave him a better comprehension than the other two. Mm. I had the, my, my difficulty... Of course, that's not the, what's that happened. My difficulty is nobody is talking about eternal life. All of these religions... You hit the nail on the head. Not a single one of them. The Muslim religion gives them a more logical view of right. the temporal. Right, right now. The Christian will confuse them because Christianity in its truth is not centered on life. It's centered on eternal life. Mm. And in order to comprehend that, you have got to be willing to go beyond temporal life, which most people are not. And of course that explains why. Every Christian knows that the Father is loving and would never do that. They have no, they have no idea what the that that they're talking about is, but he wouldn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a lot of most Christians find the Bible confusing. That's yes. why they want to hear somebody give them an up, an update on what what does this mean? What does that mean? <clears throat> Christianity does not purport to be able to be understood from a logical human perspective to begin with. It tells you, you have to shock your human comprehension. You gotta walk by faith, not by sight, just to begin to get an understanding. Most people don't wanna go that road. Yeah, as Brother Bray says, pack your own parachute. People are not interested in understanding for themselves, pursuing themselves, the meaning of anything as we see in Psalms 82. And Satan delights in that. But they will, they will it makes learn. it so easy for him to do what he does. How many people do you think, when the hammer falls, will say, oh, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, I wish I'd, I'd wish I'd listened to that guy. When they're in eternity, yes. 